All right. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us for what I believe will be a very, very exciting and inspiring panel. Uh, my name is Shania Taylor, and I am the Deputy Director of Programs at the National Academy of Medicine. I will be moderating the panel for you this afternoon. And so before we get started, we would like to give a very special shout out and extreme degree of gratitude for this invitation to present. We are grateful to our partners at the University of Maryland Center for Community Engagement, Environmental Justice and Health. Very special thanks to Dr. Sakobi Wilson for his innovative, sustainable and groundbreaking work in the climate space. I think you all will find that through the National Academy of Medicine and UMD CEEJH partnership and collaboration that we are truly working together to mitigate climate inequities within communities that are historically and currently marginalized. So with that being said, I will go ahead and introduce our illustrious panel and then share a bit about what we hope to cover during our time today. I have the privilege of being joined by my colleagues at the National Academy of Medicine and our partner at UMD. So I'll start uh, with Chris Hanley. Um, he is a senior program officer and the director of the Grand Challenge on Climate Change, Human Health and Equity at the National Academy of Medicine. Um, we then have Olufunmi Layu, also known as Fumi Chinakezi, Program Officer and Director of the Climate Communities Network, which you'll hear more about. It's an integral and driving component of the Grand Challenge on Human Health and Equity at the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, we then have Grace Robbins, who is an Associate Program Officer who works very closely helping to build out critical components of the Climate Communities Network with Fumi at the National Academy of Medicine as well. And we are super excited to be co-facilitating this panel with our partner at the University University of Maryland, Arielle Wharton, who is a faculty assistant and climate change and GIS specialist um, in the Center for Community Engagement, Environmental Justice and Health. And so during the session, we're going to have some time for Q&A at the end, but we're going to start out with Chris sharing an overview of the Climate Grand Challenge, and then we'll learn more deeply about the vision, collaboration, and plan for the Climate Communities Network from Fumi, Grace, and Ariel. Our panelists will have an opportunity to reflect on the process of launching the CCN, including lessons learned thus far, as well as sharing their aspirations for what the CCN can accomplish through their member leadership. So the panel is going to highlight novel research that is led by Dr. Sakobi Wilson, Ariel and team from the Center for Community Engagement, Environmental Justice and Health. And so we'll continue to talk a little bit more about how this particular novel research informed and will continue to influence the Climate Community Network's development. So thanks again to UMD for the opportunity to feature our work. And with all that being said, Chris, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks so much, uh, Shania. Hi, everyone. Good morning. And uh, as Shania said, uh, my name is Chris Hanley, and I serve as the director of our Climate Grand Challenge. And uh, we'll be talking to you a lot today. We'll be communicating a lot of messages. But one thing we really want to make clear to, to start this, to start our time together, is that we at NAM uh, and all of our partners see that the climate crisis is a public health crisis. We know that there are 20 million deaths each year that can be linked uh, across the globe to climate change. And we also know that uh, our system, our healthcare system, which is designed to really help people um, and lift people up, is in some sense doing the opposite as it has, uh, as we in the US have, as a healthcare sector, emit approximately eight and a half percent of uh, the US's carbon emissions every year. And then uh, thinking more broadly, uh, globally, we do know that the U.S. healthcare sector emits 25% of global health uh, sector emissions, which is by far the uh, large proportion across the global health sectors. And so we know this is something that uh, we need to, to address and we need to, to look to uh, make changes towards. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, as we as we approach um, trying to solve this and trying to alleviate some of these issues, we know re we really have to, to focus on equity because we know that, of course, across the globe and certainly here in the U.S., the health threats and impacts of climate change are not equally or fairly distributed uh, across populations or geographies. Rather, they disproportionately affect people living in the most vulnerable, under-resourced and disadvantaged environments. And as illustrated here in this diagram from the fourth National Climate Assessment, we know that in the U.S., children, older adults, low-income communities, and communities of color disproportionately experience health-related impacts of climate change, 
due to ongoing and historic systemic inequalities. And as a result, these populations have fewer resources to prepare for, respond to, and cope with the impacts of climate change on health. And in summation, in many ways, climate change exa exacerbates existing health and socioeconomic inequalities, and many consider it to be a driving factor of health inequalities more broadly. Next slide, please, Grace. So in looking to help to alleviate um, some of the issues caused by climate change on health, when we sat down with our advisory committee years ago, we knew that this, this problem is obviously massive. It's um, integrated into every part of our day-to-day -day society. And we knew that the scale of it required uh, our solutions to be its equal. We knew that we needed inspiring new and bold approaches. And we knew this was an issue that one sector couldn't solve by itself. It had to be a public-private partnership and that investment had to come from both of these areas. And when uh, National Academy of Medicine sat down, sat down with our advisory committee, we talked about several different ways and different approaches and different tools we have to, to try and, uh, and approach this, this problem. And one concept kind of come, kept bubbling back up and that was our NAM Grand Challenge, which as our president, Dr. Zhao, um, as he puts it, the NAM Grand Challenges of Health and Medicine seek to inspire the nation the, and the world to coalesce around shared priorities and audacious goals for addressing the big challenges and opportunities in science and medicine. Next slide, please. So we knew this is how we wanted to approach it. We know this is the tool that we wanted to use. And, Sarah, and out of it came our National Academy of Medicine Grand Challenge on Climate Change, Human Health and Equity with the goal of seeking to improve and protect human health, well-being, and equity by working to transform systems that both contribute to and are impacted by climate change. And the way we set about achieving this goal was to outline five strategic objectives, which I do think they're important to run through quickly because they do map to each of our five programs, which obviously we're talking to about uh, one of them to you today. But really quickly, our strategic objectives are to communicate the, uh, the climate challenge as a public health and equity crisis, which you've already heard me start to do today. We also wanna catalyze the US healthcare sector to reduce its carbon footprint, as well as developing a longer scale roadmap for larger systems transformation. And we'd also like to accelerate research and innovation in the climate health space. And then lastly, uh, the reason what we're gonna to talk to you mostly about today is we're really looking to reduce climate related health inequities. Next slide, please. And I won't go through each of them, but you can see here the five programs that we currently have as part of our Grand Challenge. Uh, but today we're going to talk to you about our Climate Communities Network. And with that, I will ask for our next slide and turn it over to you, Fumi. Thank you so much, Chris. Just trying to figure out how to get off mute, <laughs> but thank you. Um, and good morning, everyone. Uh, just to reiterate, my name is Fumi Tanakezi and I'm a program officer on the climate team at the National Academy of Medicine for the Climate Communities Network, or CCN. Next slide, please. So as Chris alluded to um, earlier, we know that many communities in the U.S. do not have fair access to the resources and infrastructure needed to keep their communities healthy and well. And these communities are often not equitably engaged in the decisions that affect community health and well-being, and we see this happening across many issues, including the worsening climate crisis. We know that climate change impacts and exacerbates health inequities in this country, especially when you think about other existing unfair social and economic factors, such as racism and poverty. Next slide, please. And so with the Climate Communities Network, ultimately our vision for CCN is a society that equitably prioritizes and protects the health of all communities from the threats of climate change. Next slide, please. And so when we think about the purpose of the CCN, the Climate Communities Network really seeks to engage and center the expertise of communities in regions that are disproportionately impacted by climate change to address related health inequities. The network will also serve to inform the work of the overall grand challenge, as we've just heard Chris describe. Um, and really it's going to be a forum for 
the members and strategic partners, which we will talk about later in the presentation, to work collaboratively together with the NAM and other partners to identify and develop solutions to climate-related health inequities. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the network will engage both members and strategic partners, um, which I mentioned on the previous slide. Um, and we'll just walk through some definitions for how we see these um, key players for the CCN. So community leaders will be the core group of the CCN. These will be CCN members. Um, and these um, individuals will work for community-based organizations and identify through an application process, um, which we recently closed a few months ago. Um, and these members will work with one another, as I've just described, um, as well as the NAM and strategic partners to advance their community's priorities. They will represent their organization and serve as liaisons to the community that their organization serves. And so strategic partners um, will be a complementary group of invited governmental and non-governmental organizations that will help advance community priorities through their expertise, through support, and various resources. And so one of the things that makes the CCN unique is this sort of three-way partnership that we are trying to form. Um, and so strategic partners, they will be invited organizations across various sectors that bring, as I mentioned, tangible resources and actionable expertise to the table in direct response to members' needs and priorities. Next slide. And so this slide briefly um, walks us through the eligibility and qualifications for both members and strategic partners. And so really quickly, uh, members must be at least 18 years of age. That was one of our eligibility criteria. Um, and I just mentioned they must work for a community-based organization um, in a U.S. state or territory. Um, and then importantly, the organization should be located in the same community that it serves. Um, and our parameters were that only one applicant per organization could apply for this opportunity to be a CCN member. Um, additionally, uh, members' organizations must serve a community that is disproportionately impacted by climate change and climate-related health inequities. And we'll talk a little bit more um, about how we envision um, or our sort of um, parameters for defining disproportionately impacted. Um, but the organization must also be engaged in or planning to engage in work related to climate change um, and that promotes health equity. Um, in terms of strategic partners, uh, the qualifications, we're really hoping that strategic partners um, will have the ability to, again, leverage their organizational platform and resources. We, of course, want them to be dedicated to health equity and authentic community engagement. Um, we are hoping that they will have an understanding of the connection between climate, health, and health equity, as Chris um, sort of described earlier. Um, we really want this to be a multi-sector group, um, so really bringing expertise from various sectors, whether that be transportation, agriculture, et cetera. Um, and we want them to be able to facilitate connections um, for the CCN members. Um, so this is access to information, access to decision makers, funding, um, research, technical assistance. Um, and then importantly, we want them to be able to advise the NAM staff. So we know that we are not the only experts. We don't know everything. Um, and we really want to um, launch the CCM with that approach, right? And so we want the members and strategic partners to really advise us to really have a leadership role um, and really drive the work of the network. So the members and strategic partners, they will be collaborating with one another, sharing with one another um, and learning from one another. Next slide, please. So in terms of our expectations for the network, um, both members and strategic partners, we will be seeking to um, have at least six virtual um, CCN meetings over 12 months. Um, we will have an in-person convening, which is actually coming up this fall. Um, and that will be happening uh, one in person every year. Um, we really want, and we um, talked a little bit about this already, but we really want um, both members and strategic partners um, to be liaisons between their organizations and communities that they serve, um, the CCN and the overall Climate Grand Challenge to facilitate that multi-directional communication and learning um, that I just described. Um, and then importantly, um, we really want everything that the network does to be co-developed. Um, and so everyone seen as an equal partner, um, working to implement a work plan to advance um, the community's goals as well as the overall network goals. 
And then of course, we will be conducting evaluation activities to make sure that we are having the impact that we want to have. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the anticipated impact that we see through the CCN um, in either the next slide or maybe the one after. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> so this is our um, impact framework as is. Um, and I wanna mention that this is what we see as our anticipated um, focus areas and outcomes. However, this will be iterated on with CCN members once they have been onboarded as well as strategic partners. So again, really co-developing everything from the beginning um, and really making sure that everyone's input um, is involved. So our potential focus areas right now are policy, funding, research and data, capacity building and youth engagement. And you'll see on the slide the anticipated outcomes that we see aligning with the potential focus areas. And so for policy, we're really hoping that the CCN can help drive more community input on federal, state, and local policies. With funding, we are really looking to promote equitable community-driven investments and innovative funding models for climate and health equity work. And then in research and data, I'm really looking to collect representative, context-specific and actionable data. Um, and so we'll be working, um, hopefully, with the members on that. And then capacity building, just knowledge and use of climate and health tools and resources. There are so many climate and health tools and resources that exist and really wanting to bring all of that to the table for, again, that information sharing and um, that learning and that collaboration. And so. Um, the final um, piece that I'll talk about on the slide here is um, youth engagement. And so um, we recognize how important, how critical it is to engage younger generations in climate and health equity efforts. And so we're really looking to do that through the CCN as well. Um, but again, I will mention that this is all um, going to be on the table once we convene the network for the first time, once members and strategic partners have been onboarded. We will be um, iterating on this, getting input, um, and deciding collectively together on our impact framework with everyone in the network. So next slide, please. And so we, um, I talked about how we anticipate sort of leveraging the work of the Climate Communities Network to address um, structural drivers of climate-related health inequities, so the policy, the funding, um, and that means working on all of those issues. Um, and so those are our impact areas. And we will talk briefly um, about the process that we've undertaken to launch the CCN. But before we do that, I wanted to share um, our commitment as the NAM in standing up this initiative. So the National Academy of Medicine is committed to maximizing benefits for the CCN and co-creating opportunities for both members and strategic partners to build relationships with one another and form a community of practice for, again, shared learning, networking, and collaboration. We really want to amplify the community's and organization's expertise. And so, again, we recognize we are not the only experts and really want to use our platform um, to amplify the expertise coming from all of these organizations and communities. Uh, we would like to elevate the community and organization's efforts to address climate-related health inequities because we know so much work is happening on the ground. Um, and we also want to um, access partnerships and tools um, to advance or scale community-driven solutions. And so we're really committed to sort of driving partnerships um, and again, making sure that the communities and organizations have the tools they need to advance community-driven solutions. Um, we obviously want the network to be able to inform climate-related interventions that are identified by communities and align with their priorities, including the efforts of national initiatives such as the Climate Grand Challenge. Um, and again, influencing the direction and outcomes of the Climate Grand Challenge as equal partners is something that's very, very important to us. And we're working to really make sure that the CCN is integral to everything that the Climate Grand Challenge does. So. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Grace, to talk about sort of our process in standing up the CCN. Thank you, Fumi. And hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, my name is Grace Robbins. I'm an associate program officer at the NAM. I um, was really delighted and honored to be able to support Fumi and the rest of our team in advancing this work. Uh, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about um, where we have been, where we are now, and where we are going. Um, this is a high level timeline uh, showing the process of standing up the CCN. Uh, you'll see that it was broken up into three phases. And as we'll be reflecting on later in the presentation, 
um, we ended up adding more time than we initially expected to the stand-up process just to be able to attempt to do justice um, to the values of community engagement and actually standing up this program. Uh, but we started off in phase one um, last year to really define uh, at a high level the CCN's purpose and scope. And we really benefited from two strategy meetings and internal consultations with trusted advisors to be able to give us feedback on our project plans as drafted. And once we felt like we had a strong concept to present, we held an external listening session in December of last year, moving into phase two here, to really be able to present our mission, vision, purpose of the CCN, how we intended uh, to select members and strategic partners, um, and what we hope to accomplish together once we brought these two parties together. And we opened, opened up our project plans for external feedback, and we're really, really delighted by both the live participation and the multiple um, survey responses and email responses we got after that session. So much so that we extended the amount of time that we had originally budgeted to look through, synthesize, and apply that listening session feedback to our project plans. Um, we devoted a, a large part of um, this uh, early this year, this spring, to being able to really look through uh, and consider all of the feedback um, and suggestions that we received and really felt um, wonderful at that point about actually opening member applications in May. Uh, so that we could really reach the communities and the community leaders um, that we wanted to be able to uh, join and lead this network. So the opening of applications in May closed off our second phase, um, and we are now in the midst of phase three. Uh, we, are, um, we have closed our member applications and are in the process of reviewing them. And we are also thinking critically about how to bring our members and strategic partners on board once selected and confirmed. And that process will be happening throughout this month and the month of October, as we um, lead up to the very exciting launch of the Climate Communities Network, which will be happening uh, as a hybrid meeting um, at the beginning of November. I did want to highlight uh, one significant time point on the actual opening of the member applications. Uh, the applications were open for a period of eight weeks uh, from May to July, and we were Said we had set a goal for ourselves to be able to get between 50 and 100 final applications. Uh, and we're really delighted to be able to receive 70 final, incredibly strong applications with strong regional distribution. Um, we, you can see here a uh, distribution of our approximately 70 final applications over the uh, regions of the United States, including states, uh, states and territories. Um, and these regions are broken down by the fifth national climate assessment definition of, of US regions. So we were um, very happy with our spread. And as, as I turn it over to Arielle in a moment here, um, you'll be learning a little bit more about how that regional lens really guided both our promotion and our review process. And that is where we are today in the midst of reviewing these applications. Um, and I'm excited to be able to uh, let Arielle dive a little bit more into the work that the UMD Siege Center did um, to really drive a critical part of our review process in terms of identifying uh, at a geographic and hyperlocal level communities that are experiencing disproportionate impact from climate change and related health inequities, because we really wanted to be able to strongly consider that variable when looking through um, the member applications. And so with that, I'll go ahead and pass it over to my colleague, Arielle. Thank you so much, Grace, and thank you all for having me on this session with you you. Um, it was a pleasure working with the National Academy of Medicine, especially, specifically your team um, on this project. Um, hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Ariel Wharton. I am a climate change specialist for the Center for Community Engagement, Environmental Justice and Health, um, which was founded by um, Dr. Jacoby Wilson, um, who is a professor within the Maryland Institute of Applied um, Environmental Health at the University of Maryland College Park. I just want to give a quick overview of what Siege does um, and why this partnership was really um, a really crucial and important space for both um, both partners within the space that's within reviewing the Grand Climate Challenge, I should say. Um, so our center's primary focus is to engage highly um, and differentially exposed populations and underserved communities with in environmental justice and health issues. Um, our focus is to advance environmental justice through empowerment science. Dr. Wilson always says, you know, you wanna empower these communities, get, you gotta get in those communities, 
um, help help these communities advocate for themselves when no one else is advocating for them. So at the center, we, we do a lot of community-based participatory research, um, citizen science, where, you know, as I mentioned, we allow, um, we go into communities with, with the use of mapping tools, um, technical assistance, um, uh, educational programs, um, and uh, other communication spaces, research, writing white papers, so that we can really um, use the, these, these findings, these data findings to help push for policy, help push for, um, again, these communities to advocate for themselves. Um, and uh, I will say next slide so that we can kind of have more time to speak on the actual pulp of the work. Um, so within Siege, we do have some main objectives. Um, we Siege's main objectives is to be a national and global leader in addressing environmental justice and related health inequities due to environmental racism, structured inequality, and neoliberal policies. As I mentioned, the use of community-based um, participatory research framework, citizen science, collaborative problem-solving model principles, and partnerships within diverse communities um, and community-based organizations to empower the underserved and overburdened populations that are not only being affected by um, climate change, but um, health, health disparities, um, the exposure to um, toxic chemicals um, and other hazardous exposures, I should say. And we also serve as a link between these frontline and front and fence line communities. When I say frontline and fence line, I mean these are the communities that are really um, that are uh, within cold mines or near to cold mines, I should say. Or um, there are dumps, there are super fun sites right within these communities. There are industrial plants um, within spaces. You know, we know the the Houston Ship Channel. We know the um, Curtis Bay within Maryland that is near to within actually there is this community is built around a, a cold mine and so this is what we mean by frontline and fence side communities. Um, we also we also partner sorry with other community-based organizations, other environmental advocacy groups, health professionals, researchers, education, educators, educators, students, policymakers, government agencies um, and Within these partnerships, we are all trying to identify and address environmental justice and health issues within the mid-Atlantic region. Um, so we do have five cores um, that the main cores that I um, am working within are the research core, the community and outreach engagement core, um, the education core, and also the communication and policy core. You're probably like, that's a lot. But I do work within many of the different cores. And um, that's why I was really so excited to just be a part of this program, this project with the National Academy of Medicine. Um, next slide, please. So um, when we first started this partnership with the National Academy of Medicine, um, the main question was to examine where and how climate change is disproportionately effect, effect, affecting and impacting different populations across the United States, as well as the direct and indirect health effects that these populations are being affected by. Um, but also included in that question, that research question was um, explore how these different communities are taking charge and working together across different sectors, different sectors to develop strategies to mitigate and or to adapt to the climate change, to climate change and climate related health impacts. Um, so within um, our team, we really had to separate um, the, the, the many de deliverables that were necessary for this for this project to be successful. Um, so we were able to gather literature, gather data from great literature, um, academic journals, scientific reports to really highlight the priority populations that, um, as I mentioned, were being dis are de being disproportionately impacted by climate risks and health disparities due to their social, behavioral, environmental, and institutional settings across the 10 national climate assessment regions. And these regions are um, Northeast, Southeast, Midwest, the Northern Great Plains, the Southern Great Plains, the Southwest, Northwest, and 
including Alaska, Hawaii, and the US Caribbean. So as I mentioned, you, you I heard, I, I mentioned deliverables. We essentially with the NAM team, we decided that we would have three sets of deliverables, main deliverables, I should say. So the first set really focused on um, a really, um, apologies, a literature review on population th synthesis, which was um, a really extensive, um, high level literature review on population synthesis. For secondary analysis, data was gathered from, as I mentioned, great literature, academic journals, scientific reports to highlight specific priority populations. Our team chose to really highlight sp very specific populations. And these populations include children, older adults, low-income Americans, African-Americans, Asian-Americans, Indigenous peoples, Latino, Latina, Latinx, and Hispanic populations, Caribbean Americans, urban populations, and rural populations. Based on this literature review um, and population th synthesis, indicators for known risk factors were identified and selected for each of the five identified domains of measurement. So when I say domains of measurement, I'm speaking more along the lines of where these different indicators or factors are placed within um, data sources or mapping tools uh, and things that really help you quantify quantify these um, effects or uh, burdens that are within communities. So for example, pollution burden is an overarching um, sort of umbrella. And under that umbrella is environmental exposures um, and pollution. Oh, uh, environmental exposures, apologies about that. Um, I'll also go a little further into the exact indicators in the next slide, but, um, and then environmental effects, um, climate change and health and socioeconomic factors are also included within the indicators that we were used to, um, that we use to identify um, these priority populations. So another de deliverable um, that we were able to use, um, as I mentioned just now, once we had the literature review and population synthesis, um, once we cr um, conducted, I should say, the literature review on population synthesis, we were able to um, use those indicators and that data to create maps um, for the entire contiguous United States, as well as the individual regions, as I mentioned, the National Climate Assessment regions, so the NCA, um, the NCA 10 regions, um, and we were able to create maps for those specific regions as well as the contiguous United States. The data we use, the primary sources of data, I, I would say, um, are we took these data data from data sources that of from well-known online EJ mapping tools. Um, so this include the US EPA's environmental justice screening tool. This include the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Environmental Justice Index. So that's the CDC EJ index. Also, the White House Council on Environmental Equalities, I'm um, sorry, Environmental Qualities, Climate and Environmental Justice Screening Tool. So that's the CGIS. Um, and um, the climate change indicator data was specifically compiled from the Federal um, Emergency Management Agency. So it's FEMA's National Risk Index and the health indicator data was taken from the CDC places data set. Um, we did have additional sources of resource, um, di a different, additional, sorry about that, data sources um, that needed to be included. Um, the more data you have, the, the more accurate, the more um, robust, the more high level, the more pithy, um, you, the data is necessary to really examine what is happening within these communities. Um, and so we really wanted to ensure that this, these deliverables were um, as accurate as possible, at least from our team, from our side. Next, please. So I mentioned the, the mapping segment, the mapping tool, the mapping 
deliverable. And within the mapping deliverable, we were able to create um, a composite environmental justice score using um, the data that we had pulled from these many other existing mapping tools. So the composite environmental justice score was created to assess environmental justice within the US at several geographic locations. And it also examines where and how cumulative environmental problems are impacting different populations. Um, as I mentioned, we did pull, we did combine and pull data from other existing mapping tools. I did read them all out in the previous slide, so I will save you right there. Um, and I will just move on to kind of speaking more about these five domains that the data um, was pulled from to create this score. So I mentioned pollution burden from environmental explosions. So for ex an example of the this type of data would be particulate matter 2.5. Um, so that's PM 2.5, that's really um, smoke, um, traffic, traffic, traffic smog. Um, this, this particular <laughs> particulate um, really um, can be absorbed within the lungs causing um, respiratory diseases, um, issues with asthma, um, and um, ozone was also, is also an environmental exposure in this category, in this domain, and air toxics, and air toxics and cancer risk. And then when I speak about pollution burden from environmental effects, this is speaking, focusing more on um, treatment, storage, disposal sites, hazardous waste proximity, um, I did mention, you know, um, the cold sites um, or even um, the dump, dump, dumped, sorry, the dumps within certain communities um, that that would be within this specific domain. And then we know climate change, that, that data will focus on heat wave data, um, hurricanes, or flooding, and then health data would focus on asthma and cancer and socioeconomic data factors will focus on low income, people of color and housing burden. So I just I know that's a lot of information, but I just want to want to share what exactly the data is being pulled from and what, what, what we're actually using to actually come up with this specific score that will essentially measure and show measure the disparities within these communities and essentially show which communities need the most help, which are most vulnerable and which are most exposed to environmental burdens and climate change impacts. Next, please. And this is just a simple um, table, just showing um, the different domains and the different indicators that we used. Um, I just added this just in case, you know, for, for visual purposes, so you can get an idea of what it looks like. Okay, so this diagram actually just reiterates what I just spoke about verbally. Um, I just redundant. Um, I just kind of, essentially, we pulled the climate change data domain, we pulled the environmental exposures, and we pulled the environmental effects to all combine in the pollution burden domain. So as shown in this figure, environmental exposures, environmental effects and climate change were all used to determine the pollution pollution burden. And then as you see with the within the bottom space, the health and socioeconomic factors were used to determine population characteristics. So what does this all mean, you know? Um, this this composite environmental justice score, and for the purpose of for moving forward in this, this this presentation, I will name it the the siege score, um, the CEJ score, I should say, was calculated by multiplying the pollution burden, which, as I mentioned, it was weighted by the average of environmental po pollution exposures, climate change, and environmental effects, by the pollution characteristics which was the average of the health and economic factors. Next score, next please. Thank you so much. So we did calculate this for the contiguous United, New United States. Um, as you can see, it's 
the acronym is CONUS. Again, so moving forward, I will be referring to it as CONUS. And um, you can essentially see, um, it paints a picture of what the data is looking like across the United States. Um, if you look at the legend, um, it is color coded. And within this legend, yellow, the top is saying that that has those, those areas have the lowest siege score and the areas within the red regions have the higher east, higher higher siege score is what I should say. Um, you know, just staring at this map, I can see that, you know, maybe the south southwest region or even maybe the you know midwest region a little bit south and south southeast region i should say not southwest apologies southeast region has a higher score however when we did separate um these mapping spaces by regions we did see um different results um that we we different results to what we think this this conus map should actually relay. So, next. Okay, so as I mentioned, we were able to calculate the score. And so this table essentially just shows the, the scores, the siege score from highest to lowest within the Midwest region. So the Midwest region comprises of the state of Illinois, Ohio, Indiana, Missouri, Michigan, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. From our analysis, the, the region with the highest score was the Midwest. And this, this highest, the highest score was um, about 0.56. Um, Initially, this was not what um, we were thinking it would be, um, but this is what, based on our calculations, this is what we came up. This is this is what the data was showing, is what I should say. So, um, and then the next slide will show the the lowest siege score um, and the northern no, northern Great Plains region. Um, they had the lowest siege score of 0 0.38. And this region comprises of Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, and Montana, and Wyoming, forgive me. So I mentioned we two of the deliverables. So the first one was the literature review and population synthesis. Um, the second one focused on the mapping, mapping portion, which was a pretty big portion of this project. And the third deliverable were case studies. Um, so the case studies provided a comprehensive overview of climate mitigation, adaptation, and re resilience issues and efforts in communities differentially affected by climate change um, and health impacts. Uh, our team also analyzed case studies according to these same 10 regions that I mentioned, the NCA 10 regions, and the populations that we chose uh, to study for within this specific study. Um, so within, within this deliverable, we decided to select five to six case studies that really reflect the efforts made in not only the specific states, but amongst the specific communities. So, you know, you can examine the state, but it's it's really important that you look at the population within those states. Um, and that was something that I feel like we, we really had to ensure that we weren't doing a surface level dive on just focusing on what's happening in the states because the it's not as you really need to, to focus on the actual population, the community that's being affected and what efforts they are doing or, or moving forward in to, to um, mitigate or alleviate these issues. Next slide, please. So from our results, based on our results, as I mentioned, um, the Midwest did show the highest burden in within this space, within both aspects. So um, 
and the northern Great Plains showed the lowest lowest exposure, lowest burden, I should say. Um, we really wanted to focus on providing research-based recommendations for the climate communities networks. Um, so specifically, this portion focuses on the regions, um, and our analysis really highlighted um, specifically which regions were being at which ex experiencing disproportionate impacts from climate hazards and, as I mentioned, related health disparities. Um, we wanted to really focus on prioritizing promotion um, and recruiting for the Climate Communities Network within these vulnerable areas. And that was something that um, both parties, both partners agreed on. And um, once we actually kind of move forward with these deliverables, um, it was really important to, um, to, to, to focus on promoting the actual program the, so that people can, can act, be a part of it and, and contribute. Um, so additionally, we, we were recommending that future studies could expand on this analysis um, as the CEJ score is a more novel novel mapping tool, um, mapping portion, I should say, it, it would be helpful to incorporate additional indicators within emerging, emerging climate change frameworks. So um, although there are climate climate indicators, there, there can be more. Um, that is a space, I think, most mapping, mapping tools, most mapping um, components are really trying to um, include more climate climate change indicators um, within their um, analyses within their their technical assistance spaces because that as we move forward with increased frequency um, increased intensity with these um, climate impacts you know that is going to be really important moving forward um, additionally um, qualitative assessments and content analysis by NAM can really reveal conditions contributing to these increased climate change risks within the communities and guiding efforts across the 10 NCA US regions. So although we although we were able to study the populations within this paper and um, although they were they are extremely highly vulnerable to climate impacts um, there were specific subpopulations and subgroups that were identified as particularly susceptible due to various factors and therefore they really should be included in the network um, so these include low-income population indigenous populations children, older adults, um, AAPI populations, Caribbean small island developing states, and communities without citizenship or new immigrants. So non-English non speaking households, um, that would include non-English speaking households, I should say. And so we did have some overall recommendations as well for the Climate Communities Network. So this would be um, ensuring that we are really trying to overcome communication and la language barriers and engendering cultural congruence, um, really in leaning into the importance of capacity building, um, the need for resilient infrastructure within these communities. Um, so investing in infrastructure, um, up, up, upgradation, I should say, is essential to health and community resilience, um, allowing these communities to have access to sustainable funding, um, operationalizing equity as well. So measures of climate equity describe communities' experience in responding to, preparing for, and recovering from the effects of climate change-induced disasters. And these climate change induced disasters can be, you know, storm water or flood, storm water or flooding, hurricanes, extreme heat, etc. And additionally, the use of EJ mapping tools, environmental justice mapping tools for micro targeting areas in greatest need of intervention. Um, I added this in just so you know, the the through mapping health, environmental, climate, socio socio demographic apologies, and economic data 
environmental justice screening and mapping tools or EGSM tools, they really reveal the inequitable distribution of environmental and climate burdens across these communities. And so we did include within the um, our final, I would say, paper or white paper that we we we, we agreed on within um, this partnership. We did include more recommendations, um, but I really wanted to include within this presentation um, some of the main recommendations that we really pulled out and wanted to emphasize within the Climate Communities Network. Um, so in conclusion, um, these findings really indicated that climate hazards and resulting health disparities linked to climate change are extremely unevenly distributed across the U.S. Dis dis and disproportionately affecting specific populations. Um, as I mentioned, the composite EJ score or the SIEGE EJ score concluded that the Midwest had the highest overall exposure to climate hazards resulting in climate related health disparities and the North Northern Great Plains had the lowest overall exposure to climate hazards. We also found that across the country, communities are diligently working to address climate change through the de development of climate change, climate action plans, preservation and restoration, building capacity within their locals and also creating hazard mitigation plans. It is also worth noting that while regional statistics offer valuable insights at a broader level, they may or may not provide the necessary granularity to address practical issues at the local level. Um, so as a solution, we, we did recommend leveraging sex, census tract data or, or scores for more detailed spatial information at the local level. And, you know, I know we, we probably go into that a little more, but the importance of having granular data um, within this this within the climate communities network, um, it, you will we can touch on that more later. So, great, thank you so much, Ariel, and I'm happy to to pick up here and and take us through our last couple of slides. Um, I think building directly on what Ariel shared in terms of the research based recommendations. Uh, we, we as a collective CCN team have learned so much over the course of planning to stand up this network. Uh, and we know that there is going to be so many more lessons learned to come, especially when we have our members and strategic partners on board and they are uh, driving, driving the work. Um, we really did try to build in and, and will continue to strive to build in time to reflect on what we have learned so far, um, like into our actual work process even when it's challenging to quote unquote, find that time, we really do see it being um, time very well spent because it does help us ensure that we're continually reflecting on the way that we do our work. Is it aligned with the values of community engagement and is it having the impact that we want it to have? So building in that time for reflection, we really have seen to be critical. And we wanted to just share uh, a couple of lessons learned distilled at a high level on this slide. Um, and while they, while they may seem high level, as I shared, they are really grounded in our process. And um, we came to these key themes um, by reflecting on you know, what went well and what we really want to be able to do better um, or expand on moving forward. So first and foremost um, is that we need to take our time to do this work. Uh, that might be very intuitive for uh, community engaged and community led work, understanding that it is going to take time. Um, but finding that time or advocating for that time is not always easy to apply uh, in an organizational environment where we're dealing with lots of competing internal and external demands and where we do have accountability to multiple parties. Um, but we have really appreciated the support that we've gotten um, and the times when we have advocated to expand our timeline, um, just to give us more time to seek input, iterate and co-design uh, the different plans that we have for the CCN. Uh, as I shared earlier, a key example of when expanding our timeline came in handy was after the December listening session, the first time that we had a chance to get public feedback on our work, we were um, delightedly overwhelmed by all of the excellent suggestions that came in. And we will, really felt like it was worthwhile to be able to take the time that was necessary to meaningfully engage with all those suggestions. And we really do feel like that has been to the benefit of our program. 
Next, uh, I think it goes right into the second lesson learned um, is thinking, thinking expansively. Uh, we're very aware that um, for many institutions, doing community engaged work is not necessarily going to be served by following, following a business as usual approach. Um, many of our you know, normal strategies and tactics are useful, but they're definitely not sufficient to do the kind of work that we want to be able to do. And again, we, we really have to acknowledge and appreciate the support that we've had from our team to be able to think more creatively um, and use non-traditional methods uh, to be able to stand up this network. Um, and a key example of that was in our application promotion process, really having the freedom to go beyond traditional communications and promotion methods. And we got a lot of great uptake by taking the time and thinking creatively, uh, reaching out to radio stations, to podcasts, to hub CBOs in key impacted regions and states, uh, as, as Ariel highlighted, to really get the word out about this opportunity um, and recognizing that the individuals that we might want to reach might not be subscribed to our listserv or follow us on LinkedIn. Um, we had to do uh, some extra legwork to be able to reach the people we wanted to reach, um, but now we've drawn that circle of communication to be even more inclusive. Um, and I'm really glad that we were able to, to have the support to think extensively. Next, uh, wanting to really highlight, and Ariel did a beautiful job of, of sharing the value of why this is so critical, um, really wanting to highlight that co-developing is key. Um, we know that the biggest part of our co-development process for the CCN is about to begin. That's when we're going to bring our members and strategic partners on board later this year to really co-develop every part of this network. Um, but even in the lead up to the launch, we've so appreciated and benefited from the time uh, that we've spent engaging with uh, other people who are committed to this work. And a great example of that is our collaboration with UMD. Um, Dr. Wilson, Ariel, and team have been critical thought partners um, and, and our conversations with them, their research uh, has directly informed different decisions that we've made with the CCN. Um, so critical to our review process, the CEJ score that Ariel um, did a deep dive on is being incorporated uh, into our review process so that we can really identify and consider applicants that are applying from regions that are at a census track level, I should say, applying at a census track level that have a disproportionate impact of climate change and related health inequities. And we're able to take that meaningfully into account as we consider their applications, because uh, as Ariel stated in her recommendation, we really do want to be able to distribute the resources and tools and support of the CCN according to need and really build on the strengths of communities that have been underserved or disregarded in the past. Um, so definitely very grateful for all we have been able to, to build and co-develop with our UMD team um, our UMD colleagues and are excited to continue um, iterating with UMD and with other experts, including our members and strategic partners to really make this program values aligned and have an impact at a local level. And I think this last lesson goes without saying that practicing humility and patience and all we do, um, it, it really it really undergirds our work uh, and our, we are constantly constantly reminded and appreciative of the fact that feedback is really a gift. We've appreciated all of the feedback that we've received so far. Um, and I think it only goes to make the program stronger. Uh, and then continuing to practice the patience, understanding that it's going to take time to develop these relationships to build this foundation, but that that time spent and those strength of relationships will only make the program more impactful in the long run. So with that in mind, um, thinking now in the short term, our key next steps, uh, we will be planning to uh, select members um, at the end of September. As I mentioned earlier, our application review process is underway, and we're looking forward to being able to select up to 20 members by the end of this month. We also will be convening um, our potential strategic partners in an interest meeting at the end of this month as well, so that we can aim to confirm 12 to 15 strategic partners. And, those two, um, those two groups will come together to be the first cohort of Climate Community Network participants. We'll be onboarding um, these two groups uh, in October and um, a specific onboarding project that we wanted to highlight uh, is a photo voice project that we will be um, building in collaboration with our members and with expert artist and facilitator Andrea Levy and team. And this photo voice project will be an opportunity for members to share um, using creative, uh, using a multitude of creative means, photos, drawings, visuals, um, narrative and caption to really represent their community's strengths, their community's priorities related to climate, health and equity, 
and their community's visions for the future. Um, basically what they would hope to accomplish through the CCN and we're excited to be able to, to elevate and amplify um, those messages coming directly from member communities. And last but not least for, for this phase at least, uh, we will be actually doing the, the first implementation phase event uh, at, the, at, the end of, uh, at the end of this year, early November, will be CCM meeting number one, actually bringing together the members and strategic partners for the first time to launch this effort. And so we'll be excited to share um, outcomes from that meeting and the work of the network going forward. Before I close and pass it back to Shania, I just want to take a moment to give our sincere thanks to our sponsors, AstraZeneca, JPB Foundation, WK Kellogg Foundation, and our collaborating partner, the National Academy's Gulf Research Program, um, who really make this work possible. And with that, I'll close with utmost thanks. Um, please do feel free to reach out to us uh, at this email here with any questions or comments. We also welcome you to sign up for this mailing list to learn more about the Climate Grand Challenge and the Climate Communities Network specifically. Uh, but Shania, I can now pass it back to you and I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Thank you all so much. Thanks so very much, Grace, for passing it back. And wow, such wonderful and great work that you all are doing. So I just want to echo your thanks, Grace, and many thanks to all of you, to Chris, Ariel, Grace, and Olufumilayu, aka um, Fumi for describing your great work, um, your planning and collaboration and vision for uh, the Climate Communities Network. And so we really want to give a special shout out to Ariel and all of the intentionality that really goes behind, uh, that went behind creating the CEJ score. It's really evidence that your team has truly made an effort to amplify the concerns of the most vulnerable communities. So thank you again for sharing. Um, we are going to have some time for Q&A, um, so we welcome those of you who might be watching to submit your questions um, via StreamYard and or YouTube or Facebook. Um, and we are going to kick off our panel, our, our question and answer with a few questions that I have for each of our panelists. And so I think I'll kind of go in order of presentation, um, if that makes sense. So I, the first question is going to be uh, to you, Chris. Um, so really just wanting to know, um, in your experience, what do you feel has been the biggest challenge in really ramping up the NAM Climate Grand Challenge this far? And then also, once you state that challenge, how do you feel the program has met that challenge? Yeah, that's a, a great uh, question, Shania. So thank you for asking it. I think the, the biggest challenge um, for NAM so far, and I think it's one that we're all facing, is that this work in climate and health probably should have started 30, 40 years ago. And uh, we are very much in catch up mode and uh, we work with members and individuals and people in the media who um, like us all have been just reading the headlines recently, especially this last past summer about all these, um, all the effects that are clearly, clearly with climate change at the center of them. And so there's just a lot of energy right now and, and kind of getting our, our arms around that energy and how to, to best push it forward without um, stepping on each other's toes or without um, becoming maybe upset if a group isn't moving as fast as we like it to. I think that that has been the, the biggest challenge. And I think we here at NAM have set to solve it. And we've really uh, tried to provide pathways for however people are ready to contribute um, to this effort, wherever they are in their either decarbonization journey or they're planning for programs to kind of provide them as a, a home um, that could be a large initiative or it could just be uh, an organization. So that's really how, how we've gone about it. Um, and I would say also specifically for, for NAM and what you heard me talk about earlier is this is such a large program that it really takes public private partnership. And anytime you do that, you have so many stakeholders with uh, so many competing interests. And again, just kind of bringing them uh, together um, has been our focus. And we've been really focused on trying to just create a groundswell of effort so far. So not trying to slow anyone down when they are moving along quickly in this, but really just trying to be the convener of anyone who's who's um, working in this space. So a little convoluted, but that's, that's our best answer. 
No, awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. I mean, I think uh, you made a really great point in terms of making sure, trying not to step on each other's toes. And I think that, to your point, uh, is making sure we're communicating, right? So many different players are working within this space. So it's really great when we have an opportunity to present um, at symposiums like this so we can get the word out, right? So we can continue to work outside of silos and collaborate. Um, so thank you so much for stating that. And one more question to you. Um, so what do you think success uh, is going to look like for the National Academy of Medicine Grand Challenge in like three, five or 10 years? What do you think? Yeah, that's a, a, again, another great question. And I think uh, I'll pick a middle point right in the middle of that. I think uh, first, firstly, we're really looking towards the um, the administration, the White House's goal of 50% reduction by 2023. So I think if we can lead our members to the 50% emissions reductions, uh, that for us is, is a huge milestone or um, at least get, get close to that. I think that, that will be a, a key marker of our success. But then we also have to do it in an in a, in a equitable way, right? Um, we can't meet that goal by going into neighborhoods and destroying green spaces in order to put up solar panels. And we can't be closing um, plants that we know cause harm to local neighborhoods in, in only the wealthiest of areas um, to start. So it has to be done in an equitable way. So I'll give you a, a hard target of 50% reduction by 2030, and then a little bit of a, a softer one that we're really gonna have to work on our milestones and goals uh, to accomplish, which is is doing so in an equ equitable fashion. But so much of that will be driven by the the, low, the communities at the lowest level uh, through CCN, because as you saw in our uh, diagram, it really, we're really looking for this program to permeate into the, the other four programs. Absolutely. Thanks, Chris. And just one thing that keeps popping up, um, and I hear it even in your answers and throughout all of your wonderful presentations, is just intentionality, right? So understanding that we have to take the time and space to put in the work to be able to make the change within this climate space. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move forward and ask, um, direct some questions at Fumi and Grace. Since you all work so closely together, I'll leave it to you all to feel free to both answer the questions or divvy them up however you see fit. So um, the first question I have is you talk, we have the Climate Communities Network um, and this wonderful partnership. So I would love to just hear from your perspective, how is the Climate Communities Network, also known as CCN, how are you all defining community? <laughs> I was gonna say that's a great question. Um, I can start, and then if you know Grace, if you want to chime in, um, that'd be great. But um, yeah, for the purposes of CCN, we thought a lot about this. Um, we know communities defined in a number of ways across various um, groups and populations and in various settings, and so. Um, it took us a while to land here, but for the purposes of the CCN, we are defining um, a community as a group of people living within a specific um, localized geography, such as a census tract, a county, city, village, town, uh, neighborhood, or tribal community. Um, so that's our definition of community. Um, and we also defined a couple of other things um, like CBO, um, community-based organization and want it to be expansive and inclusive in our thinking there as well. Um, but I'll stop and see if Grace wants to chime in or add anything. Sure thing. No, thank you for that. Thank you for that definition for me. I think the only thing I'd, I'd add is that um, one of the reasons that it was helpful to use that kind of geographic focused definition for community, um, even acknowledging, like Fumi said, there are many very valid ways to define community. Uh, was because it did let us leverage that CEJ score that UMD Siege put together at the census track level. So we were really able to think about who are the people who are living together, who are neighbors, um, who would be able to, you know, have a positive impact on each other's health equity and climate outcomes. That's, you know, who we really wanted to be able to reach. And knowing that CBOs really do that grounded local work, um, that was why they were also our, our focus in terms of who we were hoping could apply, community leaders living in a community and working for a CBO. That's so great. And what better way to be able to get that target audience by going through CBO. So it's really great that um, you all have included that sort of pathway um, to garner membership and to define what community means for CCN. So thank you for that. 
Um, so my next question is what outcomes do you envision the Climate Communities Network having at the end of year one? And so then really the subsequent part of that question is kind of what might future iterations of the Climate Communities Network look like post year one? Grace, did you want to start and then I can jump in? That sounds good. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely welcome you to jump in because I think that this is going to be one of the most exciting things about CCN meeting number one, where we're really able to take, you know, kind of our scaffolded vision of what year one and beyond can look like um, and share it with members, um, as particularly and also strategic partners for their input, iteration, direct edits and deletions. Um, so we can really build a vision for this first year together uh, and what it, what we want it to look like. But I think concretely at, at the end of the this first year we really want each member to be able to um have in hand uh a, a plan of action that they see themselves being able to implement in partnership with their fellow members and you know with the support of strategic partners in nam to address a specific climate related health and equity in their community um, and we imagine that the the meetings and convenings that we'll be having with this group Will really be an opportunity for members to identify you know what are some shared priorities um you know what can i learn from other communities that might be facing the same issue uh what are the strengths that my community is bringing um into this collaboration and how can i combine with communities with complementary strengths or with strategic partners that have key tools and resources that might be i might be able to leverage and build on my community strengths and then be able to at the end of the year have a really specific plan of action um, to be able to implement in partnership with other members of the network. Uh, and then in the future, I might look to Bumi to share um, both her vision and maybe some of our concrete scoped ideas. Yeah, um, thank you, Grace, that was great. Um, yeah, I. so I'll talk a little bit about sort of beyond year one and then like overarching what we see as um, some of our outcomes. So um, definitely, this initiative and we're really hoping that it will be long-term. So beyond year one, we're really hoping um, to begin forming learning collaboratives and, and even regional hubs um, based on the alignment that Grace just alluded to. So really thinking about um, climate and health topic areas and of course location. So really aligning um, network members and strategic partners um, based on those topic areas, based on where they're living um, what issues they're experiencing, what their needs are, what their strengths are and assets are. Um, so doing a lot of that alignment through these learning collaboratives and regional hubs. The other thing that we've talked about um, that we're really excited about and we mentioned as one of our potential focus areas being youth engagement. So really hoping that we can determine a mechanism for engaging youth. Um, and we've been exploring citizen science research as an option for this. And so really looking to explore that some more beyond year one. Um, we've also talked about surveys, um, data collection, you know, these are all, you know, in line with our potential focus areas um, and then doing some more photo voice projects. Um, Grace talked about the one that we currently have underway, um, but ultimately I just want to mention that this will all be guided and determined based on member priorities. And I know we've shared that a number of times, but these are our ideas and, and what we're hoping to do. And um, we really want the members to help shape and guide um, all of this work in partnership with the strategic partners as well. So um, these are some of the things that we're hoping to accomplish beyond year one. Um, and then the last thing I will mention is that relationship and trust building. Um, that's that's huge. It's it's major. It's going to underscore everything that we do. And that takes time. So all of year one and even beyond will be spent being very intentional about building trust and building relationships um, across and within the network. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing, Grace and Fumi. And I really love how you're centering um, this around community and really collaborating them so they can uplift their concerns. So, of course, we can predict what the future will look like for, for CCN, but certainly we won't know for sure until we get that member collaboration and, and partnership. So I'm really excited, as I know all of you all are here, to kind of see how the uh, network will organically mold itself um, based 
based on the community level input. Um, so I know we only have a couple of minutes left, but I'm going to open this question up um, to all of my colleagues here at NAM. And then I see Arielle, you've popped on with us. So I have one question for you. I'm just wondering, um, what impact do you hope the Climate Communities Network will have on NAM as an institution? Anybody can take that question. I'm happy to start. Um, oh, Ariel, you came off mute. <laughs> I'm sorry. sorry, everybody. I, <laughs> yes, I, go ahead for me. I'll jump in after you. Okay, sure. I'll be brief because I know um, I just did a lot of talking. Um, but no, I think that's a great question. Um, we've talked a lot about, you know, community engagement and how to do that um, very thoughtfully, you know, especially um, you know, within an organization as large as, as the NAM. And so we really um, are hoping that with CCN, we can, I think we talked about this a little bit in our presentation, really want to integrate CCN across the various work streams of the Climate Grand Challenge, but really the broader NASM climate enterprise. So a lot of our colleagues are doing, you know, work that's related to climate change, health equity, community engagement, and really wanting to make sure that that work, um, the work of the CCN is uplifted across um, NAM, but not just NAM, like all of, all of the academies. So the full NASM climate enterprise. Um, we um, intend to have CCN representation on the overall Grand Challenge Steering Committee. Um, and so that's one of the ways that we're hoping to sort of formally integrate the CCN. Um, but beyond that, we really just want to have increased, diverse, inclusive, and equitable um, local community representation and relationships. Um, and so that's within and beyond NAM, as I mentioned. Um, and then we're really helping to identify um, innovative mechanisms of gathering the living experiences of um, communities and um, just their expertise as it pertains to climate justice and health equity. So we're hoping that, you know, we can play both a leadership role, but also like a service and partnership role um, in terms of integrating the climate communities network um, across across NASA. So. Awesome. Thanks, Umi. And thanks for throwing in our, our well, it's a new term to me, uh, living, <laughs> I normally say lived experience, but that lived and living experience. So those that are continuing to, um, you know, have to overcome different adversities and those who might have come from a certain environment. So making that distinction of lived and living experience is so important. Thank you for offering that in this space. Um, so I realize that our time is short, but Ariel, do we have time for one more question that I could direct towards you or shall we wrap up? Um, maybe I could just add on to what Fumni was saying yes. and we can, we can wrap it up. But okay. I mean, I, I love that, that answer, Fumni. I do 100% agree. Um, I think living is a great term. Um, and it's, it's, you know, you can have data and you can have all of these um, mapping tools showing what's happening, but the app. But ask actually going out with it, into the communities and speaking with them, being hands on on the ground and understanding what they are experiencing is just as important. So I think the balance of having the data to really, really yes. access what is happening um, within those communities, but actually hearing from the communities themselves are like the just the the I would say the what is it, the cherry on on top of the icing? I think they're both very necessary. So that's that's what I will add to Fumi's comments. So back to you, Shania. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks again to all of our panelists, Ariel, Chris, Fumi, and Grace. We're so grateful to have, and thank you to our audience who has been so attentive. Um, we're really grateful for you all being here with us today. And we hope that you've learned um, about uh, the National Academy of Medicine and our, our wonderful partnership with uh, UND. Um, and so we're grateful again that you've taken the time and space to listen to us. And we hope that you have gotten some nuggets of inspiration um, from our talk and we look forward to meeting you again in another space and time. Thank you all so very much. Have a great rest of your day.